It's, um, it's always a, an honor and a privilege to stand on this uh, famous stage and bring hopefully some interesting and um, debate-worthy science for all of us this evening. So uh, Quantum Black, we are a, a machine learning and artificial, artificial intelligence um, outfit. We try to bring together data science, software engineering, technology, design, um, and even anthropology to solve complex problems using artificial intelligence. And we do that in areas like pharmaceutical, around drug discovery and development and commercial, um, in advanced industries like aerospace and so on, um, in financial services. We started life in Formula One, and we still try to bring that edge of performance to the work that we do. And through all of that, we're big fans of augmented intelligence. We like to talk about um, augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence because we're big believers in bringing the human and the machine perspective together. And we love this metaphor of the Iron Man suit. We like to try and build technology which gives humans superpowers rather than replaces them. And there are different views on this as this field evolves very rapidly. And just before introducing our speakers, um, I want to just show two short videos which will hopefully work if the, if the gods of technology are with us. Um, one showing the, something positive and exciting, hopefully, and one showing something potentially scary. So if we can maybe try and show the first video of the conversation. Here we go. This is just Let's go back to this example. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment on Tuesday between 10 and noon. What happens is the Google Assistant makes the call seamlessly in the background for you. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. Let's listen. So how can I help you? Hi, I'm calling to book a women's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 1.15. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks. Great. Have a great day. Bye. So, um, very exciting deployment of these kinds of technology. This was just about a week ago, I think, that, uh, that Google announced that. And on the flip side, there are also areas where these same kinds of technologies around machine vision, um, natural language processing, natural language generation, can seem intimidating. So I was recently in China, and someone said to me, well, you realize that everywhere you go, you will be recognized by the CCTV cameras. And I, I found this was interesting. And it turned out that actually a BBC journalist has, has gone and uh, investigated this recently. And um, this is our um, second video, which is made up of two clips. So bear with us while we switch between the two clips. <laughs> Well, let's see how long it uh, takes you to find me. Thank you very much. Let's go. Heads out onto the streets, and then we will pick him up as he goes into a, uh, a railway station. We also do like human and car matching, and also in human matching, also includes human matching, and also you often meet human interaction matching. It is when the camera is used, or when we are transporting the train, when it is at a high speed, we often know who is traveling with whom. Well, here we are then. I've just got out of the car. 
close to the city centre and for the purposes of this exercise the plan is for me to start walking in the direction of the bus station. My image has already been flagged to the authorities as a suspect and in theory it should only be a matter of time. So already on this bridge I can see one, two, three CCTV cameras. Of course there's no point hiding from them. Just keep on walking. Uh oh. Right behind me, you can see uh, just over over my left shoulder there. Hello, guys. I've been expecting you. Oh, maybe these guys aren't in on the joke. <laughs> so, um, two interesting perspectives there that raise a whole number of questions around ethics, around deployment, around the way that these kinds of technologies interact with us in our lives and so on. And so this evening we have three different perspectives on this. The first is from Martha, who's a data scientist and, and practitioner in this area, who's going to talk about um, approaches to bringing humans and technology together to solve problems and how we, how we can think about that and the questions it raises. Um, we'll then have Karina, who is a philosopher, and we'll, we'll think about how augmented intelligence can be reflected in how our mind, our consciousness, is um, also very much present in the tools and uh, sort of external um, sort of things that we use every day. And finally, James, who will think about what does augmented intelligence mean for us as humans and how can we, to some extent, augment the way that we interact with technology as our society and our behaviors evolve over time. So with that, um, please welcome our first speaker, who's Martha from Corner Black. Where is she? Where she is. Good evening. How do you feel about algorithms make, making important decisions about, about your life? What if, for example, you sat at the back of a self-driving car? How would you feel? And would you be comfortable if in the future, instead of consulting your GP, you had to consult an algorithm? What if this algorithm suggested that you should have surgery? or that you should change your medication. Would you trust it? Artificial intelligence is shaping our lives in ways that we have only now started grasping. And uh, so I'm going to share a perspective about what our symbiosis with intelligent systems may look like in the future, and also discuss how we are likely, how can we make that symbiosis safe and how can we make it for the benefit of humanity? So, I'm a data scientist at Quantum Black. As Chris said, we work with clients using data analytics, machine learning, artificial intelligence techniques to solve complex uh, business problems. And it is a multidisciplinary effort combining skills as data science, software engineering, or design. So, First of all, let's see what we mean by artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence exists as a field of computer science for a long time, uh, arguably since the days of Alan Turing, and formally as a concept since the 50s. However, the very big technological breakthroughs that we have observed in the past few years, voice recognition systems or image recognition systems, uh, or machines that can beat human champions in Go or chess, all these come from a particular branch of artificial intelligence that is called machine learning. In machine learning, the differentiating factor is that systems can learn from experience, essentially from data, without being explicitly programmed. In other areas of artificial intelligence, a human still has to program and to essentially instruct the machine about how to solve the problem. And then maybe the algorithm mimics intelligent behavior. But machine learning is slightly different in that respect because there 
what we only give to the algorithm is a learning strategy, and then the algorithm is using that to figure out complex relationships in the data and solve the problem. And so potentially, it can solve problems that, that we couldn't solve. So when we hear about artificial intelligence, we hear things in the news such as in the next 10 to 15 years, artificial intelligence is going to replace almost 1 million jobs in the UK public sector alone. However, I want to challenge a little bit thinking of artificial intelligence as a form of substitution, as a substitute to human intelligence. Because essentially the two are quite different qualitatively. Humans, we have common sense, we have imagination, we have intuition. We are able to think rationally, but we are not always rational, we're also emotional. Artificial intelligence systems, on the other hand, have none of these properties. However, they are much faster at making computations compared to humans. They are also much more efficient at pattern recognition. But at the same time, they only limit themselves to learning from data. So, and so, sometimes we think of artificial intelligence systems as autonomous agents, or as a concept of singularity, of, of an agent that can transfer their knowledge on many different respects and solve complex problems. But in reality, they don't have the same adaptability as humans do. They still rely on humans to be able to, 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 solve, to, to, be, able to be given an objective and solve a problem. And so, an alternative conceptualization of artificial intelligence is what we call augmented intelligence, which is what we're going to talk about today. Essentially, as a space where human intuition coexists with the efficiency that artificial intelligence techniques can provide, achieving performance beyond what human intelligence or, or machine intelligence can uh, achieve on their own. And to achieve augmented intelligence, it would be good to also have a perspective on what tasks that right now humans do are better to be left to humans, and what other tasks are potentially better to be taken on by machines. For example, humans are much better at writing a short story, telling a joke, or designing a new product. On the other hand, we have seen machine learning systems being a lot better at uh, for example, playing Go, playing a certain other games, or even at driving a car or flying a drone. So let's see how human intelligence compares with uh, artificial intelligence. Looking at an example, at prediction. Prediction is the most common task that uh, a machine learning system typically solves. Humans, however, we are also good at prediction. Arguably, a lot of the technology that we have built since prehistoric times come from the fact that we are able to predict the future and anticipating and create the artifacts that will protect us from it. So, who is better at prediction? Humans or machines? Let's see an example. So, this is a case study from um, some work that we've done at Quantum Black with a pharmaceutical client, and the task is very simple, sales forecasting. What the client wanted, they, they used human analysts, it took a very long time to produce yearly forecasts, and essentially uh, they wanted to make their process more efficient, but also they wanted to increase accuracy. So, when it comes to efficiency, machine learning system is performed a lot better than humans. So for that one, we used state-space state -space models as well as Bayesian models, and then we optimized over thousands of parameterizations, and all this can be achieved by a machine learning system in a few hours if you run it on your laptop. A, machine, a, a human, in comparison, couldn't perform all these computations, but still to produce a final forecast, it would take several weeks, if not months. However, when it comes to accuracy, we see something different. We see that actually 
there are certain types of markets and certain types of products where humans are better than machines and others where machines are better than humans. So essentially we see that the two perform across the board, across all forecasts, about the same. And why is that? This is because if you have, if you imagine a time series in a financial market or any, or any time series that is that follows a very clear pattern that essentially has very strong seasonality or that you have a lot of events that recur many, many times, then the machine in those cases is able to learn and it is actually able to be more precise in the forecast it will make compared to a human. However, there are always these black swan events. There are, for example, often changes in the economy or unusual competitor activity. Essentially, there are events th that render all the data that you have useless and because the future looks nothing, nothing like the past. And it is in those cases where human intuition, the innate ability that humans have to hear something and use that knowledge to transfer it to a completely different domain that enables us to be able to deal with these events better than machines can do. And essentially, in that particular case, the solution to improving overall forecast accuracy came from being able to identify which were the forecasts that the machine was most suitable for and which were the forecasts where the humans were uh, most suitable for. And essentially, how that works in the practice is that there is an uh, automated forecasting process. It returns, um, it, it returns its, uh, its process along with the uncertainty. And where we see a lot of uncertainty, where we see that the machine really is struggling, there we can have a human reviewing it or even modifying the output of the forecast. So these intelligent systems are going to be more and more present in our lives. Uh, as augmented intelligence or even as uh, machines solving individual uh, problems that we, we are used to uh, have them being solved by, by humans. And uh, some of machine learning's greatest achievements involve tasks where they really, they really demonstrate better performance than humans. For example, being better than humans, th than the human champion at playing Go. We also have right now systems that are better at diagnosing certain types of tumors compared to um, human doctors. Uh, we have also started seeing some evidence that artificial intelligence systems might be better at flying drones compared to human pilots. So we've seen all these, but at the same time, are we giving away too much of our decision-making power to machines as we see that? Because at the same time, there are also negative examples of using artificial intelligence. None of these were intentional, but they have happened anyway. So for example, recently Uber suspended their self-driving car program after a car killed a pedestrian uh, while they were testing it. This was a disaster and of course we don't want such events to happen. Or for example, Google, uh, their um, sentiment analysis system assigns a negative or used to assign a negative sentiment to terms such as homosexual or Jew. Similarly, Amazon, when they were trying to extend their free uh, same, prime same-day delivery membership, they used the machine learning system to identify customers to whom that should be extended to, and they ended up, select, they ended up not selecting um, people that were in minority neighborhoods. And of course, none of these was intentional. I mean, Amazon, for example, weren't training their systems to exclude, uh, to exclude people on the basis of their ethnicity. However, 
the system itself ended up having that output that was unintended, uh, unintended but, but still potentially harmful to people. So, and this is another key difference that humans have from machines. Essentially, artificial intelligence systems, they optimize for a single thing. They optimize for performance. They optimize for accuracy. However, humans, to live in society, we need, we need other concepts. We need, for example, resilience. We need to know that the tools that we use are safe for us and for others. We need transparency. We need to be able to justify to other people why we are making the decisions we make. We also need fairness. And this is a big concern because the world in the past hasn't been perfect, but as these systems are, are trained from data that come from the past, how do we make sure that they don't propagate the same biases and the same unfairness that has existed in the past? It is possible to create systems that actually mitigate some of those risks. Um, and this is active work that we are doing with Quantum Black, and we have seen an increased interest across several different industries, for example, uh, banking or pharmaceutical companies. And it's a good thing that people are getting concerned with these ideas, of course. So the first design principle is resilience. We need to try to align algorithms to our objectives, and we need to know that when we test them in the wild, in real-life scenarios, they're going to behave according to expectation. And this means developing the monitoring mechanism, developing detection mechanisms, and also developing corrective mechanisms for when things go wrong. And this is a joint responsibility. It involves designing systems that are robust and resilient, and even writing algorithms that test uh, that, that can test themselves, but at the same time, it involves defining within business and within companies and within society in general, who are the accountable parties, who is going to, to be responsible about uh, systems and its failures. The second concept is explainability or interpretability, which is an active area right now in machine learning. A common criticism to machine learning systems is that they are black boxes. In reality, they are not black boxes exactly because we have access to what the output will be to every input, but still, the models that they compute, they tend to be complex, hard in, too hard for us to explain in human language. And so, there is an area right now in uh, in artificial intelligence that tries to explain the outputs of, um, of uh, black box models. And what you see there is an example of such a, of such a method. With, this one is called LIME, there are many others. Um, these methods essentially exploit locality. They exploit the fact that even if a model is a black box, and even if it's non-linear, the area around a particular individual sample is going to be approximately linear. And so using that property, you're able to generate individualized explanations. So for example, uh, and this is the example that you see on the, on the page, if, for example, we, we are writing a system for diagnosis, um, to diagnose a patient, the system can generate explanations as to why we got this diagnosis. So, for example, if the diagnosis is you have uh, the flu, it can generate, okay, what were the symptoms that the system identified to that particular patient? And this can help make it more transparent, especially if, we, if you have customer-facing applications. The third concept is fairness. How do we design systems that are fair? There are two key concepts around fairness. The first one is protecting attributes, essentially making sure that there is no sensitive information that could potentially be the basis of discrimination somehow leaked into the training data. And the second one is making sure that the output of the algorithm are fair for the different groups that might be involved. For example, if we have a voice recognition system, we want it to be equally good at recognizing the male or the female voice. Or if we have a 
face recognition system, we wanted to be able to recognize faces re with the same amount of accuracy, regardless of the ethnicity of the person. And so, to conclude, let's see what we, what we saw today. We saw that artificial intelligence is not a substitute of human intelligence, and that the two can work together to create augmented intelligence and to improve performance. We also saw that the key to augmented intelligence is to be able to see which tasks are best left to a human and which others uh, are best to be taken uh, on by machines. The third thing we saw is that it is a very exciting future, what uh, artificial intelligence is, is promising us, but at the same time, we need to make sure that the systems that we design are aligned to our goals and values and principles as humans. And this is, of course, the responsibility of all of us, the people who are designing those systems, but there is an overall responsibility for everybody to be informed about what this change means and to also be actively involved in the debate to guide how we should shape our symbiosis with intelligent systems. I asked you at the beginning, how do you feel about this change that is happening? But I would like to invite you to think, what will your role be in this change? Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Martha. So um, there we have the, the practitioner's view um, from, the, from the front line. And hold that one in your mind as we shift gears to the, the philosopher's view. Karina. Oh. So thanks. It's really, really great to be here. Um, so as a philosopher, uh, I spend a lot of time thinking about human cognition. Um, and what I want to do today is to present to you um, a sort of metaphysical view about how the technology that we're using um, is becoming integrated into our cognitive capacities. So really augmenting our intelligence and what that means for um, data, for our privacy, and for things like thought manipulation. Okay, so let's begin by considering a case that made a lot of headlines. So in 2016, there was this uh, encryption dispute between Apple and the FBI. And in this case, uh, the US Central District Court of California um, ordered Apple to enable the FBI to unlock uh, the iPhone uh, belonging to one of the perpetrators of a mass shooting uh, in San Bernardino County. And as I'm sure many of you know, okay, this, like I said, it made a lot of headlines. And in fact, Apple refused to do this. And I think in doing so, it gained a lot of support from the public. So it was a good, a good move, I think, by the CEO, in part because they, they realized that it was going to threaten data security of other users, right? So they wanted to set the right kind of precedence. Um, now, the FBI actually found their way into the phone anyways. Um, but I think the case sort of highlighted a lot of our serious concerns about how our very personal data is going to be protected or not protected by the law. And actually, since then, uh, the FBI has used the dead fingers of corpses of mass shooters to try to unlock iPhones using the fingerprint recognition technology. Um, they were unsuccessful, so you can... <laughs> but still, I think it's... So I think there's something kind of disturbing about that. Um, maybe not everyone agrees. <laughs> um, so, but, but I want to kind of articulate what I think is, is sort of wrong there. And so I think part of this has to do with the fact that our democratic constitutions, at least most of them, explicitly protect uh, our right to mental privacy, and they explicitly protect our right to freedom of thought, right? And this has typically amounted to things like brain protections. So 
we are protected from being mandated to use neuroimaging lie detector tests, and we're protected um, from having to take like chemical intrusions that would meddle with our mental functions. Um, and part of the reasons for this are these explicit protections of free, free thinking. So you can't be forced to take drugs unless there's a real medical justification for that. Um, but currently, okay, the law does not extend these types of protections to our devices. So in fact, I want to suggest that the law is sort of based on this outdated Cartesian conception of where, where our mind is. So this Cartesian legacy is that our mind is just nothing more than our brains. So in a sense, it's your mind is locked in your skull, right? So you need nothing more than the brain to explain everything that's going on in the mind. And a result of that commitment is that the mind is sort of impenetrable by its very nature. And I think actually in cognitive science, a lot of people are pushing back against this picture. So the idea now is that our mind is much more fragile than that and that it's easily manipulated and nudged uh, and influenced by external factors. So this has a sort of broader picture of what the mind is. And so this is what I kind of want to convince you of today, that your mind is not just your brain, <laughs> that your mind is more than your brain. And in fact, <laughs> I want to convince you of something a bit like this. <laughs> um, so this is the picture I want to paint. And of course, it's a bit dramatic, right? <laughs> Um, but it's not a metaphor, so I really want to convince you <laughs> that your mind is merging um, with the technology you're using. So, in other words, the technology that you're using is becoming so functionally integrated into your cognitive capacities that it's on a par with your brain. On a par metaphysically speaking, but also, I think, ethically and maybe even sort of legally, we should start thinking about these things as similar. Okay. Uh, okay. So I think a good sort of safe place to start here <laughs> um, is to ask the question, what effect is technology having on our cognitive capacities? And so as a philosopher, this is a question that we've been dealing with for thousands of years. <laughs> Not that we have any solid answers, okay, but I'm going to... I'm going to argue for one tonight. So uh, the first thing to say is that Socrates actually had a position on this. So Socrates thought that technology would have a diminishing effect on our memory capacities and on our social skills. <laughs> so he actually uh, argued against the major technological shift that was happening at his time, which was a shift from the oral tradition, so from oracy to literacy. And Socrates actually warned against the potentially dangerous consequences of writing words down. <laughs> okay. Now, I don't know about most of you, <laughs> but I actually think literacy is a good thing. <laughs> and I think overall it's had a net positive effect. So, um, I don't think it's a crazy position, though. I think I should highlight that. So I think, actually, we still hear a kind of similar line today, right? So you, you often hear people say that our, our use of technology and our reliance on things like social media, for example, is making us forgetful and sort of turning us into asocial morons, <laughs> okay? So I think this picture's wrong. <laughs> So I'm going to argue that actually technology is having an augmenting effect on our cognitive capacities. So it's not diminishing, it's augmenting us. It's making us smarter. It's enhancing our intelligence. And I'm even going to argue that this is a part of who we are as humans to use technology. So we ought not be afraid of it. Okay. So uh, let's consider a study here. What affects is Google having on our memory? So this study um, showed that uh, our reliance on Google is not dumbing us down as much as it is reshaping 
our capacities, so reshaping the kind of things we remember. So in this study, um, Betsy Sparrow and her colleagues um, found that when participants knew that certain information, sort of relevant information, would be accessible to them in the environment, they were less likely to remember that information, so that particular information, and they were more likely to remember how and where to access it. Okay? So it's, it's changing the kind of things we remember. I think this should ring very true to us, right? So how many people in this room still remember their best friend's phone number? <laughs> I don't even remember my phone number half the time. I move around a lot, though. <laughs> um, so that's in part because we know how and where to access that information, right? It's in our phones. And we trust it. We feel like it's pretty safely secured there. And I think that's true of a lot of the information that we used to have to remember. So you could say that your, your smartphone and your various devices are taking over a lot of the memory functions that, that your brain once sort of had to do. And I think this is a good thing because it's freeing up our internal resources to do the kind of things that humans are really good at. So things like moral, moral reasoning, things like empathy, understanding, creativity, uh, even sort of context-specific relevance determination, which computers are very bad at. So lots of things that we're still good at that computers aren't, okay? Um, okay, so our best science tells us that the mind is just an information processing system. And cognitive science and computational neuroscience are committed to what's called the computational theory of mind. The computational theory of mind says that thinking is just a process of symbol manipulation, which is typically carried out by the brain in the form of neural computation. Okay? But a lot of cognitive scientists are starting to suggest that, in fact, it might not just be the brain that's doing the relevant information processing for us. So it could, just, it could be now a conjunction of both artificial and biological resources working together that explains a lot of our intelligent capacities. So what I have in mind here is not just things like smartphones and really good devices, but also things like simple technology, so the example of writing, so a pen and paper. So the uh, Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman described his thinking as happening with his pen in his notebook, right? That's how he described it from his perspective. And I think you'll hear a lot of expert mathematicians say something similar. So the expert mathematicians need to have a pen and paper in order to perform their complex calculations. So they create external symbols and then they push them around on the page in order to come up with um, different theorems. And actually, there's, there's kind of an old joke that all a mathematician needs to do her work is a pen and paper and a wastebasket. And all a philosopher needs is a pen and paper. <laughs> Philosophy jokes typically don't get that kind of laughter. <laughs> so thank you. That's charitable. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, <laughs> OK, so um, Herbert Simon, one of the fathers of computational um, of computer science, and the computer, <laughs> um, defended this principle of near decomposability, which has now been sort of accepted as a tenet of the cognitive and brain sciences. And according to this principle, it doesn't matter where some part is located, and it doesn't matter what that part is made of, okay? What matters is the rapid and intensity of the interactions between a particular part and the overall cognitive system. So we can sort of measure um, you know, what sort of dimensions matter here. So the typical candidates are things like um, bandwidth connections, uh, effective information flow, um, bidirectionality of connections, so having a two-way connection. Uh, lots of music here. <laughs> um, and... Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I got lost there. Um, so, so what matters is the intensity of the connection, so there's a bi-directionality between them, and that they're a stable connection. And so what I, what I would suggest here is that for many of us, so as we know, we don't use all the parts of our brain, right? There's often parts of your brain that get unused, at least not very regularly, too. But a lot of us use our phones all the time, right? There's a constant connection. The information in the phone is highly accessible to us. Um, we rely on that information to effectively guide our behaviors. And we endorse the information as true, so we don't question its veracity. And all of this would be sort of similar to what's going on in other parts of your brain. And it, in fact, there's even studies that show that, so if most of us look at our phones within the first 15 minutes of waking up, right, and that we, some of us even experience sort of phantom ringing and phantom buzzing. <laughs> and so, so all this is sort of suggests a sort of very tight connection between you and your phones. <laughs> So, the suggestion I'm making <laughs> is that for our, our science of the mind, insofar as the science of the mind is concerned, the skin and the skull are not theoretically significant boundaries. Okay? And this is a claim that was defended by philosophers Andy Clark and David Chalmers. And Clark, in particular, uh, argued that humans are the offloading ape. <laughs> So we're the ape that likes to offload our dirty cognitive labor into the environment. So we have machines and tools that do our the things we don't want to bother doing, and we're very good at that. <laughs> so this is sort of like one of the core ideas of his philosophy. And there's this nice New Yorker piece that actually just came out a few weeks ago. Um, it was all about Clark's, Clark's ideas, so I highly recommend it. Another one of his sort of core ideas is that language plays this key role in, in, in our development, our cognitive development. So language is an external symbolic system which we created and which allows us to have higher order thoughts. So thoughts about thoughts, beliefs about desires, second order, third order, so on. Okay. So what does this mean? Okay, so what does this tell us about you know, privacy and data and so on? What can we learn from these ideas, these crazy philosophical ideas? <laughs> Um, okay, so first of all, I want to consider some applications in healthcare. Um, so the case of uh, sort of a, a population of uh, Alzheimer's sufferers in inner city St. Louis. So they scored uh, dismally on some cognitive memory tests, scored really poorly on them, so poorly that doctors thought, based on their scores alone, they ought to be relocated into full-time care facilities. Um, but doctors were surprised because they actually seemed to be functioning very well in regular life, uh, even in inner city life, which can be very complex, places extra demands, urban life places extra demands on the brain. Um, so what they did was they visited their homes, and what they saw was that these patients had restructured their home environments. So they had labels all over their walls about what to do, when to do it, they had family photos with people's names written on them, okay, names of friends and family, so that they didn't have to rely on their internal memory, right? So that information was in the environment when they needed it. Some of them had even taken doors off of their cabinets, so they'd created open storage cabinets so that they didn't have to remember where their checkbook was or where the plates and, and uh, cups were. So sort of creative strategies, too. So if you think, well, if we had removed these people from their homes, surely their cognitive functioning would have dropped off, right? So what that suggests is that there might be ways in which we can use, especially with technology, our devices to sort of fill in the cognitive gap. So people who have neurodegenerative conditions, like in this case, might be able to rely on things like personal devices. So devices that can remind them when to take pills, or order groceries for them, or you know, even use visual recognition technology to remind them who's who in their life. So I think there's a nice sort of lesson we can take from this case. So you might think, well, nothing I've said is really all that new, right? So, I mean, advertisers have known for a very long time that they can hijack our attention and influence our decision-making. Right? That's something they're very good at. 
And in a sense, you're right. So this is exactly the type of lesson that has influenced the philosophical view that I'm describing. Um, but I think what's new here is that with some of the technologies that we have now, so the, the things we carry around all the time and that are online, um, our thoughts can be intruded upon even before they're fully developed. So even before you've sort of come to a conclusion on a particular topic, you might be getting influenced by you know, um, advertising in your social media stream, for, for example. <laughs> so there's a sort of double-edged sword here. So there's a, a great power in being able to use these technologies, but I think there's also a big concern that um, they might be used in the wrong way. And especially, I think, with big data. So big data now can um, nudge people in a very uh, cost-efficient way. So they can sort of customize, based on your data, a nudge that's going to be good for you, <laughs> a nudge that's going to be effective for you. And they can track how effective that is with a relevant algorithm that learns based on the user's behavior. And then it can adjust according to what kind of results it's getting. So this is a whole other level of just the kind of nudging we've traditionally seen by government, by business. And it raises this sort of whole branch of thorny ethical questions. Uh, I sometimes sort of joke that there's a new branch of applied ethics that I call Facebook ethics. <laughs> and it opens up all these new questions about when does a nudge become manipulation, right? And can we really, you know, what is the ethics of trading your own personal data? And how should the law protect your data? So these are some of the big questions that I think philosophers and industry have to grapple with now. And I think also actually the public. So we need to think about how we feel about these, these new technologies. And, and part of that is, of course, understanding how they work exactly. OK, so I actually wrote this article earlier this year where I kind of confessed <laughs> that my phone would tell a more intimate story about me than my best friend. So I just want to highlight just how much data is on these devices, right? So your phone has a higher quality and quantity of information about you than any piece of hardware in the history of mankind, including your brain, okay? My phone knows who I talk to, when I talk to them, what I say, what they say back, how long it took them to reply, right? Where I was when I said those things. It has all my photos, all my purchase history, all my biometric data. It has my notes to myself. <laughs> and it has all of this dating back years. <laughs> That's, and it's with a high accuracy. So our brains are susceptible to false memories, as I'm sure many of you know. <laughs> Um, so the phone records all of that with a very high degree, right? It's not changing or altering information. So, I mean, so again, this, this suggests that there's something very intimate and different going on with these technologies. And actually, um, the U.S. Supreme Court Chief Justice John Roberts actually cited this observation, okay, in 2014, um, the observation that your cell phone holds a higher quality and quantity of information than any piece of hardware before in history. For the courts, uh, in a court's decision, so in his written opinion of a court's decision justifying why the Supreme Court now demands that police get warrants before they search your smartphones in searches incident to arrest, which are a particular case in the US. So there's a new precedent now that other objects can be searched, but when it comes to smartphones and devices in the US, um, police have to get a warrant, even if it's when you've been arrested. And that's the reason he's given for that. And in that uh, justification, he also notes <laughs> that um, these phones and these devices have become such a sort of persistent part of daily life that he says the proverbial visitor from Mars would likely conclude that they're a part of our human anatomy. So I think <laughs> many of you are probably clutching your phone right now as I say that, right? Um, and it's not, it's not a crazy thought. <laughs> so it's not only a kind of extended mind, it's a kind of extended body as well. And so what I want to suggest, and what some philosophers are beginning to suggest, is that as a result of this interconnectedness, 
the, the phone and any sort of device that contains this kind of high amount of personal data ought to have the same kind of protections that were traditionally given to your brain and ethical considerations. Okay, so I'll just end quickly. So of course we can't go back to being illiterate, <laughs> right? So even if we wanted to, <laughs> um, but I think we can still take some nice wisdom from Socrates. So Socrates says to know thyself, okay? And I think it's important to remember that we are the offloading apes. So this is something that we do very well and what we want is to create a world in which everyone feels comfortable and safe actually offloading this information in the ways that we will do and will continue to do. And what I would commit is that in 2018, to know thyself is to know thy cell phone. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Karina. Some, uh, some mind-expanding concepts there, quite, quite literally. Um, and I'd now love to introduce our, our third speaker, James Hewitt, who will help us think through how we can augment ourselves as we go through um, all of these changes. James, clicker is all yours. That's Thank you, Chris. Thanks. What a fantastic series of presentations. I was standing there in the background while I was trying to fit this headset, um, listening in intently. It's given me a lot of ideas to think about. My name is James Hewitt, and I'm a performance scientist. I research human performance in both sport and in business. I'm particularly interested in sustainable high performance and how lifestyle and work interact to maybe enhance or inhibit that performance. And this evening, I'm going to explore some of the same themes that have been talked about already, but perhaps through a different lens. Now, we've worked for quite a long time in high-performance environments. Um, I work with a company called Hints of Performance. Uh, we have worked in Formula One for over 20 years. We often talk about Formula One as our laboratory. We've been quite successful in that context. Actually, 12 of the drivers that we've worked with have won Formula One World Championships. We've got a great success rate there. And often I talk about Formula One as an example. But how many people here have driven a Formula One car? Not many. You know, most of us, we don't have the luxury of Formula One focus. You know, I think for many of us here, we probably find that the work we do, likely many of us are knowledge workers who use our brains to generate our value, we find that that knowledge work is becoming increasingly complex. There's a lot to pay attention to. Karina alluded to that in terms of how we use and engage with our smartphones. 79% you know, of people, according to some research, look at their phone within 15 minutes of waking up in the morning. How many people here actually manage to wait 15 minutes? Apparently, 42% of us admit to using email in the bathroom. Perhaps we do that because we have to spread six hours of email use over the average day. One in five people actually admit to using email while they're driving. 92% multitask during meetings. You know, we'd like to pretend that we're writing important notes, but everybody knows a few emails are coming in and out. And what do we do to relax at the end of the day? Well, if you're anything like me, you get home, you sit on the sofa, maybe you put something on Netflix. But we can't just watch a single show anymore, can we? We have to switch between that laptop, a tablet, and a smartphone according to some research, 21 times an hour. Most of us are more likely to be fragmented than we are to be focused. So what is the solution? Well, some of you may have seen this Financial Times article, which uh, came out a couple of months ago, about a new generation of San Franciscans who find that LSD in microdoses makes them more relaxed, more focused, perhaps even more creative. So... Have I got a treat for everyone this evening? <laughs> Not really, I'd probably get arrested, wouldn't I? Um, I was interested to read on in this article. They interviewed Paul, a startup founder, and uh, he feels that him and his team have been less stressed since they've started microdosing. But they couldn't actually be sure about the cause and effect because it might have also been the project management system, Asana, that they started using at the same time. And this kind of got me thinking. You know, if we can't tell the difference between a software as a service and a psychedelic substance, 
well, perhaps we're not addressing the root cause of this distraction and fragmentation problem. You know, staying on track, paying attention to the right things at the right time, for many of us, feels like a battle. Stay focused on that difficult task. Or should you check that message that just popped up on your phone? Are you going to go to the gym? Or are you going to stay in bed? Are you going to drink tonight? Maybe not everyone here does, but uh, I try not to drink on weekdays, Monday to Friday. But I can always find a reason. You know, Maybe it's a good day, maybe it's a bad day, maybe it's something to celebrate, maybe it's something to commiserate. And often it ends up with, well, just one glass. What is going on? Why does it feel like such a battle to stay on track? We know our attention is expressed in rhythms. Rhythms throughout the day. And we can see rhythms of attention that are related to fatigue. This is a graph from a fairly recent study um, that used a classification system to describe how we see this shift away from what we call executive attention networks when we're fatigued. We see rhythms of attention based on what we value. Actually, there's some interesting research emerging that suggests that self-control, rather than acting like a limited resource, actually operates more like cost-benefit decision-making operates more like a valuation process. It seems to be associated with something called the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex, which you can see highlighted on this little area here. Now, we can actually see and measure these rhythms. And I'd almost forgotten that I've got this thing on my head. So in the great tradition of the Royal Institution, I'm going to try and do an experiment. And I'm going to go over here to the corner, try and switch over the screens, and show you what is going on in my brain. So bear with me. I'll be back, hopefully. Okay, how are we doing? Is it up there? Yep. Right, there it is. This is a three dimensional rotating model of my brain. And this cascade of activity that you can see is actually my brain activity. Now, this is a mobile EEG headset. It's connected to my laptop with Bluetooth. There's 14 different channels on it. And we can use it to measure different brainwave frequencies to understand when attention starts to, starts to be um, uh, really significant, where we see the shift away from those executive networks, those parts of the brain right at the front of the brain. Now, this particular visualization is more artistic than it is scientific, to be perfectly honest. But I wanted to illustrate the point that Actually, we do have tools available to us in a way that weren't available before to actually make more of these measurements, to actually unlock some of the secrets of the brain, to understand what does optimal performance look like? When do we get fatigued? What kinds of things are fatiguing us the most? Today, I'm going to be talking quite a lot about attention, a part of the brain at the front of the brain, often associated with the frontal cortex. So as I'm introducing these ideas, Keep this rotating model in mind, those rhythms of activity, those frequencies that are going on for everybody in this room right now, because we're really just starting to scratch the surface of what's possible. I'm going to disappear again and back to my PowerPoint, because everybody needs PowerPoint these days, don't they? You can't cope without it. Let's see. Right. How's that? We back. It worked. Incredible. I dropped my microphone in the process, but uh, that's okay. So we can see those rhythms, those rhythms of attention. But take a step back right now while I readjust this headset. How fatigued or focused do you feel right now? Do you have rhythms of work, of rest, and of play? What is really urgent? What goals do you value the most? What goals are lighting up your dorsal anterior cingulate cortex? Now, most of us find that it's all too easy for our brains to get hijacked and overwhelmed. You know, I think these smartphones that we use that can be so much a force for good, potentially, often distract and interrupt. Now, I can't give you each one of these headsets, but I can give you an opportunity to test your own brain. I've got a little activity for us to do. Everybody ready? Feeling alert? 
The first thing I want you to do is to remember five words. Cat, apple, truck, burger, telephone. The second thing I'd like you to do is to recite the final five letters of the alphabet backwards. And I'm only going to give you five seconds to do it. I'd like to do it out loud. Everybody ready? Let's go. Very good. Now, the final task. Can you calculate 15 times 19 in your head? Five seconds. Put your hand up when you've got the answer. Wow, you're a smart group. Anyone bold enough to shout it out? Exactly. Now, that wasn't the whole purpose of that task. How many people can remember those first five words? How many people can remember all five? Yeah. Yeah. Got it. How many people can remember four? Four is the average. I won't ask anybody three. Now, that little game was actually designed to illustrate how cognitive load accumulates. Maybe you felt it. You see, one of the things that interests me as a, as a scientist is how can I measure things? And while it would be great to fit these to everyone's heads and measure their cognitive load, I needed to come up with some kind of simple heuristic. So this is adapted from a model called the cognitive task load model, which describes the load associated with almost any task as the aggregation of three dimensions. Three dimensions you just experienced in that little game right then. The first dimension that you experience that contributes to cognitive load is time pressure. If I introduce time pressure into any kind of task, I can increase the cognitive load associated with it. The second component is complexity. If I had asked you what was 2 plus 2 relative to 15 times 19, I imagine for most people 2 plus 2 would have come to you a little bit more quickly. There's a third component that contributes to cognitive load. Perhaps it's the most insidious component. That component is switching. Because if I get you to switch tasks and interweave them rather than do them in sequence, I'll increase cognitive load. I'll also increase the time it takes to complete that task. But even if I don't increase the time it takes, I'll measurably increase stress. So think about the aggregation of those three components to describe cognitive load and then divide it into your, in your mind into what I call three cognitive gears. A low cognitive gear where you might be recovering. You might even be task negative. You let your mind wander. A high cognitive gear where you've got sustained focus, where there's minimal distractions and interruptions. And then a middle cognitive gear a medium gear where your attention is distributed, where you're switching regularly. I'd like you to think for a moment about the aggregation of your cognitive load, the distribution of your time in those cognitive gears. How is your cognitive work distributed in the average day? You know, most of us find that we spend too much time stuck in this cognitive middle gear. A middle gear that means we often get caught in pseudo work and switching. Now, I travel quite a lot with my role. Uh, last year, I did about 168 flights uh, across four different continents. And uh, wherever I go in the world, I like to do an experiment. It's quite a simple experiment. It starts with me buying a takeout coffee. And when I buy that coffee, I make my order, I stand in the queue, and I look around me at what people do. And there is a global epidemic. It seems that nobody anywhere in the world anymore is, in, is capable of waiting for more than five seconds without pulling out the smartphone. Maybe you're doing emails, maybe you're looking at social media, but actually it's just another form of work for our brains. What could have been a moment to look around to interact is sucked up by the smartphone. We know as well that in the workplace, switching tasks regularly, perhaps even unnecessarily, increases stress. It increases time on task. It could also make it harder to switch gears either up to that high gear or down to that low gear if you, if you really need to because of something that we call attention residue. Some of your attention seems to adhere to one task and needs to be peeled off before you apply it to the next one. Now, often, it's the people who need to pay attention the most who are the most at risk 
of distraction. Multitasking, according to some research, can cannibalize as much as 40% of our productive time. A typical office worker, according to some, is interrupted once every 11 minutes. Apparently, we switch our activity once every three minutes. Sometimes this limitless life that many of us lead may actually be a limiter. Always being on seems to work quite well for robots, which is maybe okay because they're coming for our jobs. You may have seen this study. Apparently, in 60% of occupations, 30% of the work could already be automated. So what about the other 70%? That's the thing I'm most interested as someone who is obsessed with human performance. Well, actually, I think it is about this augmented approach. It's about discovering what humans and machines do best distinctly and integrating it together, just as Martha shared at the beginning. You can see in this diagram, which I'll be happy to share, some of the capabilities which humans and machines uh, 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 possess and maybe how we can start to think about they would be distributed. But ultimately, I think we're looking forward to an age of intelligent automation. More specialized roles, improved decision making, hopefully increased productivity and efficiency, enhanced innovation, perhaps. But to achieve this, we need to make ourselves as human as possible. The World Economic Forum published a report a couple of years ago now, exploring what kind of capacities and capabilities they think are going to be most important in the future of work. And they narrowed it down to complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, and coordinating with others as being some of the most important to survive and to thrive. But how do we cultivate these capacities day to day and discover a more human way of living and working? Well, we need to find our human rhythms. The time of day effects may account for 20% of the variance that we see in cognitive performance. In many of us experience a peak. It's often best for high gear work where our vigilance is optimal. A trough may be best for that low gear work where we really need to focus on recovery. And then a rebound. Now, it's interesting, during this rebound, it seems that actually our inhibition associated with the frontal cortex is reduced. And it, this, this period might actually be very good for insight work and creativity. But how often do you think about that natural rhythm during the day and actually try and synchronize your work, rest, and play with those different phases? Most of us don't. Now, for 80% of people, they experience a peak trough and rebound. For about 20%, they experience it in the opposite direction. You, know, you might call yourself an owl if you're this, in this category. You probably find that you feel quite slow to get started in the morning. You probably experience some kind of trough mid-afternoon like most people, but you really get going in the evening. Whatever the case, that trough is associated with many negative outcomes in terms of health, in terms of ethics. We see some terrible decision-making in many different contexts at that point of day. But as I mentioned, that rebound period, you know, often we waste it but that attentional inhibition might actually be incredibly valuable. We might actually be able to use it for enhanced insight. But the key is to discover a more human day and actually start to try and live and work and play in line with those rhythms. Perhaps be more intentional about recharging during that trough. You know, really thinking about how you can use medium gear, isolate it, stop it creeping into everywhere. And then also maybe relearn how to focus. When was the last time that you actually created some space to turn off the devices and work on something in an uninterrupted way? I think that many of us need to rediscover how to recover. One of the ways that we can do that is actually to start to schedule it in our day. Real breaks. Now, I know in London, in the city, we're absolutely terrible at this. But schedule your breaks and make it social. There's some evidence that suggests that spending time with people that you like spending time with is one of the most restorative things that we could do. It used to be called a lunch break. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what happened to those. Also, short bouts of physical activity seem to be incredibly helpful to help us recover. You know, it could be a walk to lunch with a friend. How radical. And finally, Avoiding pseudo-work. Perhaps leave the phone 
in the office, at the desk, at home, and have a period where you engage with the world around you in a different way. I don't think we should eliminate middle gear. Actually, it's likely impossible, but we could rethink that middle gear. Maybe start to synchronize the switching activity with the rebound. Concentrate on choosing menial tasks during that time. Minimizing it and isolating it, but being open to the kind of insights that might emerge during that time. Perhaps have a notebook next to you to write those things down. And finally, perhaps most significantly in the future of work, to retrain our focus. To create times where we guard against distraction and interruption. Maybe start thinking about working in shorter periods, but perhaps most importantly, start to work in a way with more precise goals. This is a great quote I've adapted slightly. The real danger is not that computers will begin to think like people, but that people will begin to think like computers. A sustainable human high performance isn't really rocket science. It's the accumulation of small things, small decisions, thinking about your time, thinking about your energy, thinking about your rhythms. It's about those small things done consistently well. Now, we mentioned that we work quite a lot in Formula One, and there aren't lots of principles that apply to knowledge workers, but there are some. And one in particular is a piece of advice that we often give to young drivers who have an incredible amount to pay attention to. They're struggling to keep up with this, all, all this new information they're being bombarded with. And when they get in that, that overwhelmed state, often we just take them aside and we just encourage them that when they're sitting in that car, they just concentrate on the next corner. So my question for us all this evening is this. What is your next corner? What is your next opportunity to make a good decision? a slightly better decision to work in line with your rhythms, to maybe unlock some improved well-being and performance. Whatever the case, I think one of the solutions to this is right here at the front of the brain. It's your attention. Your attention, which is the key. Thank you.